this week on Rust Rescue. We'll show you a brake conversion from drum to disc on a 64 Malibu. Then Leanne talks to David at Roberts Oxygen Company. He'll show you different welders and some of the newer products that are on the market. All this and more coming up on Rust Rescue. This segment brought to you by... If you want powder coatings, you want Mars Powder Coatings. From automotive to industrial, Mars Powder Coatings, we don't want to be the biggest, just the best. Call 704-225-1700 or visit MarsPowderCoatings.com. For the highest quality in car restoration, think Steel Rubber Products, SteelRubber.com. Call now 1-800-650-6189. Webster Radiator, keeping America cool. Call 704-785-2152 and visit WebsterRadiator.com. For service and integrity since 1976, it's the National Parts Depot. Okay, so we got all our bushings and our parts and our pieces pressed in from NPD. Um, we got the conversion kit here to change the original drum brakes in the front over to disc to give us a little more stopping power because you know, some guys like me think we have to stop for some reason. Uh, we got to get these new coil springs pressed together. We've got a tool to do that with, compress the springs. We're going to try to get this thing uh, looking a little more like a car today. So you guys go check out npdlink.com and we'll see if we can't get something put together here. First thing we do is put the up control arms in place. Make sure to put the lock washers on with the bolts. The alignment shims will be done later on on the alignment rack. Make sure the bolts are all tightened before you go any further. Using a little grease on the lower control arms will make them slide into place a lot easier on the frame. You can align the lower control arm better with a punch or a filled screwdriver than you can with the bolt. Once again, don't forget to tighten the bolt securely. You will need to compress the spring before trying to put it in place. To do this, you will need a spring compressor. We went up to O'Reilly's Auto Parts to get ours. Once you have the spring compressed, you put it in place by placing the top of it into the frame and bringing the bottom control arm to hold it in place. Then you put the spindle in place by placing it on the bottom ball joint and bringing the top control arm to the top of the spindle to hold it in place. It's easier to put the nut on the bottom ball joint before trying to bring the top arm into place. Don't forget to tighten the top and the bottom ball joint castle nuts and then place the carter pin in them to hold them in place. Once all the bolts are tight, make sure to take out the spring compressing tool by unscrewing it and feeding it down through the shock hole in the bottom control arm. Using a little Loctite, put the backing plate and the brake caliber holder in place. Using the longer bolts, put the Tyron end holder in place. Don't forget to bend the bolt locks in place.
Take the new bearings out of the box and pack them with grease. You can find a grease bearing packer at your local auto parts store. We got ours from the great guys over at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Put the bearings in place, making sure not to get any grease on the rotor itself. Tap the seal into place using a socket around the same size as the seal. This will keep the seal from being damaged when you're putting it in place. Slide the rotor onto the spindle, spinning it so it falls into place nicely. Then slide the front bearing and retaining ring into place. Then put the front castle bolt on, tightening it to the specs given in the kit with a torque wrench. Once the bolt is tightened down to spec, go backwards just enough to place a carter pin through the spindle. Remember to bend the end of the carter pin up so the carter pin stays in place. Then using a rubber or plastic hammer, tap on the grease cap. Place the brake shoe clip on the back of the pad that faces the caliber piston. Putting a little bit of lithium grease on the caliber pins will keep them sliding freely. Place the brake pads on the piston, putting the brake pad with the clip towards the back piston and the brake pad with the holes towards the front. Now it's time to install the brake caliber. Place the brake caliber on the spindle and place the bolts through it to hold it in place. Tighten your brake caliber down as snug as it'll go. Place one of the two brass crush washers on each side of the brake hose, then place the bolt through and attach it to the caliber. Okay, so we started out this morning with a table full of parts, and just a few short hours later what we wind up with is a front end that actually looks like it belongs on a car. Uh, we got the brake conversion kit done. Um, we're all set to go. We got the coil springs in, no problems, upper lower control arms. Uh, the only thing we have left to do now is we need to do our, our uh, steering links, uh, you know, connect the two front ends together, our drag length across the center, and uh, we're pretty much done with the front suspension. It's time to get started on the rear. Hey guys, you know on Rust Rescue we do a lot of welding. When you're trying to restore an old rust bucket, you kind of don't have any choice. So today we are here at Robert's Oxygen Company and we're going to learn a little bit about welders so that you can figure out what kind of welder you might need in your garage to restore your old rust bucket. I'm here with David Absher, Absher and he's going to tell us a little bit about welding because honestly I don't know a lot about it. I usually make Vince do that kind of work because I figure I'm just going to set something on fire. So David, tell us about, I, there's like three different kinds of welding, is that true? That's correct. Um, the most common is MIG welding, which is wire welding. Okay. Everybody knows it is. Um, TIG welding, which is, requires a little more skill level. And, and what does that involve? That's two hand coordination instead of one. Oh, no, that explains why I don't do it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So um, the, the MIG is what we'll predominantly talk about because that's what 95% of your restoration guys use. Okay, great. Um, easier, um, easier to deal with rust. We have a lot okay. of that. Okay, it's easier to deal with. So we'll talk about that, the different methods of gas and wire that you can use. Okay. And um, if you'd like to start with the wire, yeah, First, what, what do we need good? to know? You know, sure. somebody who's just starting out, yeah. learning how to restore cars, mm -hmm. learning how to weld, where do you even start? Okay, first, you need to go to Robert's Oxygen. Okay. <laughs> look, at, look at one of your 
Uh, closest locations online, robertsoxygen.com. Great. Get your, pick out your nearest location. We have the product in stock, the gases, the equipment. Okay, so we've got our oxygen here, and we've got wire here. Yep. And then we have... The so ground okay, clamp. This is our ground. Okay, this is probably good ground clamp. And? And this is where the flame comes and, out. And the wire gun. <laughs> the and wire gun. And the wire gun, yep. kind of like this one. Yep. All right, now, so how does this work? Okay. This, this, gas, <laughs> this, gas, this gas goes through the machine, through the gun, comes out, and it encloses this wire as it comes out the end. Okay, so the it, wire it creates actually a blanket. comes out? It creates a blanket over that wire. Okay. This wire actually burns inside an argon atmosphere. Hmm. Okay. This is clamped anywhere on the part you're welding. Okay, so you can clamp this onto the edge of the car. Yep. Great. Assuming as, that as long there's as enough you have, metal left. As long in the as you car. have the rust ground out of the way. <laughs> okay. It will not weld rust. Okay. And it will not weld air. But it'll right. weld metal. <laughs> well, that's why you want to, when you've got a lot of rust, you've got to get up that sanded off of there so at least you're working with some clean metal. Right. Okay, great. And, and it's just a starting point. If you'll grind a spot for this and a spot for you to start, it'll, it'll burn some rust. Okay. But it's a starting point. That sounds great. Now, another option you have is without the gas, they actually make a wire, which is, the wire's more expensive, um, but you don't have to buy a bottle of gas, just depending on where your budget is. Okay. Uh, you can use that same machine, just a different wire, no gas. Okay. So that's the two main uh, MIG processes. What type of wire do you recommend for, you know, we've had to weld in new floor pans, we had to weld in a whole new trunk to our car. Yep, yep. What type of wire do you recommend for that type of work? I always use the, the solid wire with the gas. It's a cleaner weld. Okay. Um, it's easier to work with and it, stays, it saves a step of cleaning up the flux off of the metal after you weld it. Okay, great. We always so, love when we can save a step with the work. Yep. <laughs> Much faster. Okay, Much faster. great. Now, you mentioned there were three types of welding. We've talked mm -hmm. about you know, the MIG, MIG and the TIG. the TIG. Right. They rhyme. That makes it easy to remember. What's yep. the third one? The third one is stick, which virtually nobody uses. Okay. Um, it's, the, it's the original way that everybody learned to weld years ago before the other two processes. It's pretty much out the door except for structural or pipe welding. Okay, great. So, so we'll stick with the yeah, MIG welding. MIG and TIG is, is where you're going you're gonna to see all the, all the action. Now, there's a variety of price points for welders, I've noticed. I've seen them you know, under $150, and I've seen them up to you know, $600, $700. Right. What's the difference, and why should we not buy the cheapest one out there? Well, the main reason is to be able to get parts for this equipment down the road. Ah, okay. Six months down the road, you burn up a gun. Uh, you mess up the regulator. Uh, one of the components inside the machine goes bad. If you'll buy it from a local distributor, they always have the parts. If they don't, they can get them within a day or two. So if you buy a import from the big box stores. He means cheap Chinese <laughs> crap. You can get no parts. I even, I've even had people come in that can't get the, the, the simplest of parts for the MIG gun. Gotcha. Okay, so, so you get what you pay for, yep. buy American, right? and you'll be able to yep. replace any parts that might go wrong. What we handle, Miller is made in Wisconsin. Lincoln is made in Cleveland, Ohio. Hey, my two old stomping grounds. There you Perfect. Go. So Support my hometown. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the things I know about welding is that it can be a little bit dangerous when you've got oxygen and flames. So what do we need in terms of safety equipment? Uh, the two, two things to remember are eyes, hands. Okay. Eyes for the brightness of the weld. Hands because they're so close to the arc itself. Or you may grab the hot piece of metal you just welded. Yeah, I would do Everybody's that. Everybody's <laughs> done that. Everybody's done it. Okay, so yeah. we need definitely need one of these sexy helmets. So Absolutely. I like the red one personally. Okay. Okay, so tell me about the different types of helmets. This one looks okay. like it has like a computer screen controls. inside. It's got some controls. This is fancy. Um, the two main differences in helmets Oops, are... Oops, too big. <laughs> it's adjustable. I like this. <laughs> um, is the viewing area. 
Okay. Okay. See how much larger this one is compared to this one? Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. And the sensors, of course, both has four. And, and what do the sensors do? What that, that picks up the arc. Oh, okay. When you strike the arc, it picks it up and darkens. Okay, great. That way your eyes are not damaged, and you can see what you're welding or where your starting point is before you start. Great, because you don't want to ever look into the arc. It's like, don't look at the sun. Right. And times 10. Times 10. <laughs> okay. Now, and again, uh, restoration guys, budget again, 100 to 300. And it's not just because of the cool paint no, scheme on this. Graphics okay. has got nothing to do with it. <laughs> so, that, well, you might as well look really cool, right? Absolutely. Um, fake it till you make it, right? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that pretty much covers the helmets. The other would be hand, of course, some type of uh, flame retardant gloves. Okay. And a lot of people would go with the sleeves or the shirts, flame retardant also. Yeah, don't be welding in your short sleeve shirts. Make sure you've got long sleeves. And wear natural fibers because your polyesters, those melt and will melt to your skin if they Absolutely. catch fire. So it's the same reason when we're racing cars, right. we have to wear fire retardant materials and all cotton. Absolutely. Great. I think I like this red one, though. I want to get the red one. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> now, what are we looking at from an overall budget standpoint if someone is just starting to weld, they need the welder, they need the safety equipment, how much should they realistically look to spend? I would say ballpark is $1,000. Okay. That's so. not too bad, actually, to get all this equipment that this is going to last a really long time, years Ameri and years. American made. American made. I love American made. Not American made. Okay. <laughs> See, the American one is much cooler. All At right. your local Robert's Oxygen store. We were talking about the safety equipment for welding, and I found this nice fire retardant jacket that matches the helmet that I like. Because having the match is kind of important, but it's a little big. Does it come in different sizes? <laughs> All sizes. Extra small to 5X large. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got some gloves here. What do we do. Um, Depending on a personal preference, so welding is is a big personal preference profession. Well, sure, you, you've got to coordinate. Some guys just, this is the only glove they want. This is the only jacket they want. This is the only helmet they want. That's fine, you know? This is very personable. A good example for MIG welding and TIG welding would be either one of these. Some of these are thinner to where you can actually feel the material you're welding or the filler metal. Okay. So. Uh, these are a little bit thicker. Thicker for more heat. Okay. So just, just depending on the application and what you're looking for. Sounds great. So your hands, your body, your sleeves, and your eyes. And your eyes. We're good to go. Okay. Now we talked earlier about making sure that you had a good clean surface of metal to weld on. Right. And then afterwards, I imagine there's probably a bit of a mess to clean up. Right. What do we need to do for prepping and cleaning sure. our okay. welds? Yeah, metal preparation would be. You can start off, the basic stuff would be simple wire brush. Hmm. Great. That, would, that would get dirt, grime, and the next step would be a strip wheel, which hmm. would remove everything except metal. Paint, okay. Bondo, seam filler, whatever, whatever's on the car. Or What about rust? Lots and lots of rust. It'll move the rust. <laughs> It now, does this attach just to your spins, drill? Spins right on your grinder. Great. Both okay. of these have the same attachment. They spin right on your grinder and just clean it right up. Sounds okay. good. What uh, about afterwards? Afterwards, you would use there's two types of wheels. The standard grinding wheel, okay, which is an abrasive wheel with resin that holds it together. We won't go into that. And a flat disc. Oh, okay. This is this is this is the latest um, type of wheel that the manufacturers have come up with that's actually moves metal and finishes at the same time. Okay. So it would save a step compared to this one. This leaves too rough of a finish, where this would actually leave a finish. Okay. So once you weld, you're going to have some lumpy spots and just High some spots. kind of metal. You'll have some. You'll there. have some what they call spatter balls. Spatter balls. I like that term, spatter balls. <laughs> and knocks them right off. Okay, great. No so now you have a nice smooth surface that you've welded, and then you're ready for some prepping and some painting on your car. Absolutely. Great. Now, when Vince welds, he always uses a hammer of some sort. 
Of course, he uses a hammer for everything. Is there something you actually need to use a hammer for in welding, or is that just vents? No, no, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a tool you need after you clean the metal to prepare the joint better if you don't have a good enough fit up. Okay. I call it an adjustment tool. Uh, some Vince calls call it, it an attitude adjustment tool. It could be, <laughs> could be, depending on your helper that day. But there's several types, um, chisel and point, okay, and chisel and cross chisel is the okay. two most popular types. And whether you like a wooden handle, uh, fiberglass handle, just again, it's personal preference. Okay. And it, it'll move the metal uh, and put it in the spot where you need to get it for the fit up of, of the best weld you can make. Okay. And you always want to have the metal fitting as perfectly as possible when you're doing your floor pans, you're doing the trunk, because if you have gaps, that means your weld isn't going to be as strong and you could have potential of water leaking into places around the edges and we definitely don't want that. You want a good, solid, strong and clean weld. Like we said before, can't weld air. You can't weld air. All right. <laughs> so I guess the last thing we need to talk about is the actual gases that you need to run the welder. And it looks like we've got a lot of different sizes and different types because this one actually says carbon dioxide, not oxygen. Right. So what do we need to know about this stuff? Okay. Um, wire welding, MIG welding, what we've talked about today is argon mix uh, or you can use carbon dioxide. That's the old style. Uh, as they've researched it, found out that an argon mix was actually a better gas to have less spatter, less cleanup by using that. TIG welding uses a pure argon. Okay. And we have cylinder sizes from the smallest to the largest, just depending on the amount of welding you'll be doing. Well, for someone that's going to be welding, working on a car, some floor pans, mm -hmm. maybe the trunk space, about how much do I need? Do I need one that's as tall as I am, or do I need a small one? Probably in the middle. Okay. Like three foot tall solar. Okay, so it's sort of like a foot. scuba tank yep, size? absolutely. Sounds good. That'd work fine. All right. And you can have it swapped out as many times as you need. Just like the propane for your grill. Absolutely. That sounds great. Well, folks, for all of your welding needs when you're working on your own rust bucket, just come down to Robert's Oxygen Company or check them out at the website below. And remember, weld safe.